So rhetorical gestures based on what people do in real life. So that ideally, actors are able to learn a particular movement technique so that they'll look right. as though what they're doing is natural. People notice that the most common form of gesture in real life is what they call emphatic gesture. So we're not talking about mime. There's not a hidden meaning. An emphatic gesture is anything that you do to emphasize the most important word in a phrase. This is an emphatic gesture. That's an emphatic gesture. Right. This is an emphatic gesture. It's what we use most often when we're speaking. It's what I just did. It's what we use most often when we're speaking. A emphatic gesture emphasizes an important word in a phrase that you're speaking. So it's emphatic. Indicative. We never, in real life, talk about a person, a place, a thing, an idea, initially, without indicating it. I would never say, I hate these fluorescent lights, Robert. I hate these fluorescent lights. I hate these fluorescent lights. Why right. in the world do we have fluorescent lights? Right. It's, we talk, we, it sounds incredibly pedantic, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I were to say, is that camera on? And would I, would I ever say, is that camera on? I would look, I would point. If you are going to talk about something, a person, this is Jeanette, have you met Robert? So that's the indicate. You indicate, indicative gesture. And the third? Affective, to affect an emotion. Anytime you see someone who has been charged with a crime, they're being brought into a police station, they're handcuffed, what, what, what do those people do? What do you see again and again? If someone is being brought in and there, and there are crowds of people, there are photographers there, just let me just ask, what do you think? Effective. Well, it depends. I mean, some people will bury their heads. Exactly. They don't want to be seen. They don't want to be seen. Effective gesture for shame. You cover the face. You cover. Right. You cover. You cover anything to do that affects shame. When I see someone, so is it connected to so if affective is connected to shame? Affective is connected to an emotion. So shame was my example. Okay, right. When I see someone covering their face, I feel my stomach going to a knot. I feel sick looking at it. Right. It's a very, very potent gesture. An effective gesture for anger right. is to make physical contact with something, ideally with yourself. Physical contact. I don't need to feel anything, but I can certainly get yeah, a marvelous yeah. response for it. Physical contact, ideally with yourself. So the effective gesture else. indicates or plays somewhat off an emotion that's happening yes. inside. It's, yes, it's to, uh, it's to give the impression that that's happening inside. How dare you speak to me that way? And the I don't fourth? need to feel anything. And the fourth? It's, uh, Let's say a fourth and a fifth. Okay. Uh, imitative, what we use the least and what everyone thinks gesture is. You're imitating an action. I'll phone you. Uh, I'll email you. I tried the lock, but it wouldn't open. It's, I pushed against it and it was stuck. Yeah. We imitate what uh, the action that we're talking about. We use those very, very sparingly in real life, but we do use them. And the fifth? The other the fifth is actually two, preparatory terminating. We never start an idea, a sentence, anything without preparing that idea, showing people we're about to speak. Okay. It's, uh, just think of the number of times you've gone to speak, someone else has gone to speak at the same time. Neither of you get a word out, and both of you say, oh, do you, I have yeah. to. Yeah. You don't even need to say anything because you both signal to each other that you're about to speak. We always do it. So these is there are a code yeah. of five gestures. And the last, sorry, terminating. So the people are never left with their hands hanging out in the air, which never Done. happens in real life. I finish an idea, my hands come home. I spin out another idea, my hands come home. So then your process of, a, speaking of a little from personal experience, your process of rehearsal with the actor is then to say, how do I take this speech, which is about this story and these emotions, and find those applicable five gestures that will then take us to that style? Yes, yes. I mean, initially, this whole thing is a very mechanical process. It's a mechanical, and I don't think mechanics are bad at all. I think art mechanics can lead to great artistry. It's a mechanical process like learning scales and arpeggios are a mechanical process. The idea is not to play scales and arpeggios beautifully. It's to give you a dexterity so that eventually you can express something and do something with the piano. The same idea is true. When I first start working with singers or actors, I may very arbitrarily be setting gesture for them to get them accessing their arms, to get their arms above their waist, where it's where our arms live with in real life. 
But eventually, ideally, with people that we've worked with for many years, right. this simply comes, has become a performance style now. Other than key moments that I want, or very specific images that I'm looking for, I can let these people go. It's like rubbing your stomach and patting your head. It's like riding a bicycle. Right. It's no longer something that is foreign. Just like if they're singing a Handel aria, they'll throw in a Handelian ornament. They're not going to suddenly say, oh shit, I meant to sing something that sounded like Rossini and I sang Handel instead. They'll always sing a Handelian ornament. They know what the parameters are. So you're asking them to explore the inside of the emotional and physical construct of that time. Absolutely, absolutely. Of that time, but at the same time, I would argue, just like the person who came up to me and said, Marshall, you sound just like David Mamet, I would say it's also of our time. I'm talking about a physical construct that is based on what human beings do, what you just did when you were describing to me what you were trying to say. But this is the other point that's interesting for me is, but by taking the speech, the impulse, the desire, the emotion, and the thought, and by actually finding those gestures that apply for it, you're in fact rarefying that experience of that truth which is then going to come out, as opposed to taking the speech, the thought, the whatever, and just, you know, while I'm, uh, you know, doing like that, doing some TV stuff, yes. where it's only, the gesture's only done in the name of some sort of verisimilitude yes. or naturalism. Yes. It's not actually done in the name of bringing out a truth. Yes. A and truth the truth that is, is the part of, it, which is the part of the, because the, Part of me is not interested in going back to the past just to see something for a museum. Yeah. Nor am I. I'm interested in <laughs> what you're doing is going back to that style because it pulls a truth out from a different space. How does and that truth is obviously speaking to people. How does it challenge us? How does it challenge us as artists in the 21st century? That's what we're interested in. Of course, we adore history. We love dance history. We love music history. All of those things. But we don't want to be a museum. Jeanette would be. Jeanette doesn't need to choreograph anything. There's so much dance notation out there, she could just choose the time signatures and start rattling mm -hmm. it off. And we could say, look, it's exactly what Marie Salé danced in the 18th century. There are times that Jeanette does that in the studio. There are some times that we have Baroque dance pr courses. And Jeanette actually says, all right, we're going to y learn a dance called, what's? Pasakai. The pa Pasakai. Or they gave names to Pasakai some of them. Pasakai for Yes, Pasakai, Pasakai Darmid. It's a fascinating thing to walk people through a dance that actually existed. But that's a scientific process, for want of a better that's word. That's research. Yes. Yeah. Once right. Jeanette starts choreographing yeah. one of our operas, she's doing the same thing as Balanchine. Balanchine took ballet, everything that he knew about ballet, as, as someone who had been an employee of the, of the Tsar mm -hmm. before the revolution, and he revolutionized 20th century ballet. But, he, but classical ballet, the imperial Russian school, was his takeoff point. He was immersed in it, not so that he could keep churning out Sleeping Beauty, but so that he had a firm grounding to do something that was new. And nothing, ref no nothing reflects the imperial school more beautifully than Balanchine's work.